Sports Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network, and I am your host, Mark. I'm really excited for this episode. I'm joined by independent music renaissance man, Oliver Ackerman. He studied industrial design at Rhode Island School of Design, founded the band Skywave and A Place to Bury Strangers, began the effects company Death by Audio, as well as a performance space of the same name. He's also founded two record labels, the latest being Dead Strange. The whole story begins in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Oliver talks about growing up and what influenced him. He talks about times when the name A Place to Bury Strangers gets awkward, as well as the trip that started Death by Audio Effects. Oliver tells how U2's The Edge became a customer, and he discusses how one review in one publication changed everything for the band. But this isn't just a history lesson on A Place to Bury Strangers and Death by Audio. Oliver explains how he decided to embrace the dumb ideas instead of doing things the same way everyone else does, and how having many different songwriting processes helps him and the band come up with a variety of ideas. He and I agree on the importance of seeing, experiencing, and supporting independent bands and musicians live. So check out the latest album by A Place to Bury Strangers, See Through You, on Dead Strange Records. Check out Death by Audio's effects pedals. Follow them both on social media. They're pretty easy to find. And follow us at Performance ANX there as well. Support us with a merch purchase at performanceanx.threadless.com. Or you can send us a cup of coffee at ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety. And remember, just like our guest Oliver Ackerman, support independent artists wherever you can. Thank you for listening to Performance Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network. Oh, yeah, I'm ready. Oh, hey, what's going on? This is Oliver Ackerman from A Place to Bury Strangers and Death by Audio. And you are listening to Performance Anxiety Podcast. <laughs> is that what you're looking for? That's it? That's what you want? Go oh, ahead. Awesome. Hell yeah. <laughs> Looks like uh, I'm viewing the belly of the beast right there. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> sure. Heck yeah. <laughs> Little patrol room. Yeah. <laughs> How's it going? Oh, good. Good. I'm, it's been a crazy evening. So we just got back a little while. I was at a wake. So... Oh, oh man, sorry about that. Well, it's okay. I mean, I didn't know anybody there, so okay, except except for my wife, okay. so, and she was it wasn't her wake, so yeah. So, so. <laughs> we don't have to do this podcast. Yeah. We, don't. <laughs> we only we stayed a little bit, and then I, we ran out and, and grabbed some dinner for us and the kids, and came home, and I crammed it in my face, and then I was wearing a suit, so I had to take that off. And, oh wow. Uh, so Wild. it's been, a, it's, I mean, I still had plenty of time to get this squared away. So any, any issues, there's no excuse, but the okay, indigestion, cool. indigestion is going to, that's. Oh yeah. There you go. So, well, anytime you take a break or anything. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So before we get too deep into things, I do want to thank Ben Kleiman for connecting me with you. That was uh, awesome of him. Yeah. So cool. It's funny. I keep calling him Ray. Oh yeah, I know me too. And always, <laughs> I'm always like, "Thanks, Ray." And I'm like, "Oh well, you know." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he must get it all the time. Oh, I know. I I did. A, I actually did a podcast with him when I I met him at a uh, a vacant lots show. They were open up for the Black Angels, and oh, he cool. was yeah, he was taking pictures, and so was I. I got, and so we were taking pictures of the same show. We just started to chat, and after the show, he gave me a card. And I didn't remember, I can't, fi- to this day, I can't find it, but I remembered Ray Raydecker. And I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, okay. So I, re- I, I followed him on Instagram that night. I, I, I found him and I followed him. And I'm like, hey, Ray, you know, we talked about doing a podcast. You want to do it? And he's like, you know, my name's Ben, right? And you're thinking, like, what in the world? <laughs> ben. I'm like, is this, a, did I reach the right guy? <laughs> he's like, no, it's just, it, that's the LLC. It's like, you know. He- no, but it's pretty cool. It's, it's memorable, Ray Raydecker. Really you know, is. So I think that he's got something going on. Yeah. I remember that from the first time hearing it, just being like Ray Ray Decker. I don't know why. It's like one of those names that'll stick with you. So he got it. Yeah, because yeah. it's repetitive, yeah. and I've never heard the name Ray Decker before. Oh, yeah. So. You should change your name to Mark Mark Shea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> be like, wait a minute, what? Well, well, I noticed when I was reaching out to you on on Skype, your Skype, your, and I'll probably take this out so people don't bother you all the time, but Whatever. Oliver Ackerman Ackerman. 
Oh, is that what it is? It's, that's so good, yeah. <laughs> so that's the theme. We're just repeating everything. Oh, yeah, exactly. May as well. So, I guess at this point, we can actually get into things. Sure, whatever you want to do, man. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you're known for a lot of things. Amazing, noisy band, A Place to Bury Strangers, and a whole barrage of things known by known as Death by Audio. Sure. I kind of want to know how you got into all this in the first place. How did music really make an impact on you? I know you you, were, you spent a lot of time, not exactly in my neck of the woods, but you, you spent a lot of time in Virginia growing up. So was there a lot of music in the house? Was, was that a big part of your childhood? Yeah, I mean, my parents, they were, I guess, kind of like hippies or something or, you know, but they're academics as well. So they were... Um, you know, I don't know, probably into kind of like protesting stuff and listening to music and into, you know, all of that kind of stuff and appreciated art. And so we always would have like, you know, music in the house and things and be playing records. And that was such a thing of like, you know, the dad stereo system and whatnot. Yeah. So oh, yeah. I grew up with that too. Yeah, totally. So there was always that. I guess that was kind of a bit of it. I had an older brother. He like was... I think, you know, right at the time of when like, you know, hardcore music and stuff in the eighties was sort of kind of going on. He was like maybe and just in high school at that time. So it was all around that time of like getting into that stuff. So when he got his driver's license, you know, I remember it's such a big thing of like, you know, him taking me out in the car one time and just cranking the stereo up as loud as it could go. And it was like minor threat or something. Oh and- yeah. Yeah. Oh, and it was so cool. So I just was then like really curious about his record collection and all that stuff. So it always like kind of whenever I finally got a, maybe like a record player in my room, one of those like combo record tape, you know, everything. Yeah, it would, yeah. You know, sneak his records into my room and listen to them. And uh, <laughs> so that was quite a bit of a thing. Then there was a time when. There was this really cool local band, which they changed their name a few times in Virginia. But uh, me and a buddy used to go watch them practice all the time. Okay. Then play shows and stuff. And I just thought they were the most badass band of all time. And so it was like so sick. You know, there's just such a thing, you know, like either go to, you know, maybe they'd have a show or usually not. Usually they'd just be practicing and hanging out at the practice <laughs> space. And, you know, me and my buddy would sit there and head bang to the music and, just loved it and it just was such a thing where we were just kind of getting into that whole vibe and stuff and then when we started me and my buddy were like kind of getting more and more into discovering music and finding these bands like you know my bloody valentine or slow dive or something it was just like what are these insane sounds and whatnot that they're creating and it just kind of seemed like someone wasn't even playing guitar or anything exactly exactly and it sounds like the diy aesthetic really took a hold of you early on yeah i mean i think so you know it's like i don't know you you know you just kind of get into those different sort of things i mean my dad was a computer scientist he would so we would sometimes have like uh access to computers and there was like that was maybe at the time where some of those things were like a game would require you to like program a little bit or something or (laughs) like savvy enough to like hook a phone up to like a weird modem or you know change some discs or some things like that and i was some key commands you know, to even make a game run or something. So. I was talking to somebody about that just the other day. I remember the very first computer game I ever played was at my cousin's house. And it was on those like big, like it was like seven inch floppy disks or something. They were enormous. Oh. <laughs> and you'd put it in there and it would say, it would say something like you are in a dark room. And then you'd have to give the, the C prompt or something of the, but you had to, you had to spell it out exactly right. Or the computer wouldn't understand what the hell you're trying to do was wild it was, it was so crazy it's such a d- kind of different sort of world but it, i guess it made you you know build things or sort of you know work within your imagination maybe and you want to get tickled that stuff maybe you wanted to, in- to improve computer game for sure because in the middle of a game it's like enter the next disc like okay then yeah <laughs> totally then you had yeah, to remember- inject it the right way or otherwise you would erase the disc Oh, yeah, exactly. All that stuff. I mean, you know, we used to have like the power supply would overheat. We'd stick it in the freezer for a while and then <laughs> go back to playing games later, you know, and stuff, of course. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. 
before you skip over this ad, give me one minute. Like most podcasts, I pick sponsors carefully and I use the products that advertise here. Pure Spectrum CBD is a product that has been really beneficial for me. They have a wide variety of great products that can be used on a daily or as needed basis. I've been using the tincture every day and it's been wonderful for easing anxiety. And I absolutely love the isolate. I use it instead of acetaminophen or ibuprofen and it's worked so well for the relief of aches and pains. They also have soaks, lotions, salves, gummies, and more, plus an entire line for fitness recovery. They even have products for your pets. See everything they offer at PureSpectrumCBD.com. And if you have questions, they're there to help. They helped me when I had no idea where to start. After you fill your cart, use code PERFORMANCEANX for 15% off your purchase. Pure Spectrum CBD, Pure Spectrum CBD, Pure Spectrum CBD. Yeah, so I don't know. There was all that kind of stuff. But then, um, you know, my friend, he could kind of play guitar. The one friend that we were getting into these kind of like weird uh, alternative bands or whatever. And then uh, so, you know, we and we had these friends bands that we thought was awesome. Every once in a while, you start to kind of are like, oh, maybe we could kind of do this stuff, too. Or I'm just interested in what these sounds are, what kind of. You know, you could you create something? And so we would just started playing music together, then eventually started writing songs together. And, you know, got like a Sansui six track recorder and we're like record songs. And well, that's you know. the cool thing that I loved about my bloody Valentine, because that I think that came out. What uh, Well, Loveless came out in, I think, 91, I think. Yeah. And I remember uh, I was in that was my first year in college and I remember my roommate had it and he was in, a, in some kind of alternative band and and he was a couple of years older and he was just he would play it and i was just like those aren't even chords what, what are they doing <laughs> yeah it was amazing yeah it was so magic those kinds of things and then yeah. you know i don't know then when you when i found out finally got to you know you plug into like an electric guitar you know and you hear these crazy sounds it's like You know, I don't know. It was just, it's such a wild thing to even, it was something different than like, you know, actually understanding music theory or something or or having to like play sort of notes or something or take the chords. It seemed, you know, even when like Nirvana and stuff, you know, even though maybe those songs are a little bit more complex than you think about playing or the remotes, it sounds really easy. And it sounds like you're like, oh, I could do this. You know, it's all about that New York attitude or something like that or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and so I don't know, you know, it just, it was just, we, I wanted to explore that. I wanted to hear more music like it. And you, we would, be, we were such record hounds as well too, at the time of like constantly trying to, you know, we would drive hours to go to record stores and do things. And then like, yes. you know, we'd, we'd go always trying to find more records and more things and find that weird, like, you know, orange juice, seven inch or something, yes. strange or whatever it was. <laughs> Oh, and yeah. then, with the one with the one weird extra track that doesn't that's not on anything else yeah yeah totally you know all that kind of stuff but it's also like you're limited by the amount of money you can you have and all of these sorts of things and what your even scope of record stores is like you know there were some good record stores in like dc and richmond and stuff and some yeah. places but you know you'd go to new york or something and you were just, I would just be blown away by the kind of selection or something. So oh, yeah. you were like, you know, you'd also want to like create music and find some, you know, figure out other ways to kind of make music of what was in the realm that you really wanted to hear or something like that. So when did you start playing music and was it with guitar or were there other instruments before that? You know, my parents tried to have me play like piano or something. I hated it, yeah. you know, and then it was like, <laughs> You know, I tried to play like trombone in school and it was miserable. You know, I just like <laughs> pretend to play, and, you know, so bad. And then, but then it was like, I really wanted to play guitar. So that was like in high school okay. and it was around the time of finding out about this music and stuff. And so, and then it kind of found out that you could make this music or even explore stuff that wasn't so about having to be so proficient in it. And so that was just exciting, you know, and that was, yeah. The one issue I always had with trying to learn how to play guitar and sound like some of my, my favorite bands, think, you know, bands like My Bloody Valentine, was things like the, the effects pedals you'd have to buy were so expensive, even you know the cheap ones. And that kind of took away from my allowance that I had to buy music too. So it was always this juggling act for me. And I, I never got around to actually really 
becoming proficient at guitar. I became really good at buying albums, but not necessarily playing yeah. guitar. I think we were so even like naive or I don't even know what it was that we thought we could make these sounds and there was like some weird trick to it. Like maybe put the tape recorder underneath the pillows, yeah. you know, or something, or maybe we like, that's what my know, bloody Valentine uh, sounded like half the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or maybe a record in this weird gutter somewhere yeah. or something, or, you know, we would try all sorts of crazy things. You know, it's like, I remember like my buddy, like, took his jumper cables and jump started a guitar one time and Whoa. stuff and you know and you know you just try all sorts of like kind of insane things <laughs> and was just curious as to what well, the heck the sounds of all this stuff was so. i'm really curious to know what a guitar that got jump started sounds like i'm not i'm not gonna tell you <laughs> I have to do it to find out oh, no. <laughs> but, uh, oh man but, uh, but, you know, so and then also because we had like a guitar and a practice amp, you know, and you kind of realize like, oh, I can just crank this up all the way, yeah. you know, and then, you know, you you start to hear all sorts of cool stuff. And you kind of also living with parents at the time at someone else's house under their mercy. You don't want to be like playing this music with them there. Yeah. You know, you were sort of you felt like a renegade or a punk or something. Yeah. So so you don't. <laughs> have these opportunities to do this at certain moments so there was even like an extra thrill and stuff to all that things too it's that's like, a good point you know you only get to do this like you know for that hour after school and my your buddy's parents are at work or something and almost like you're, there's this extra anticipation and that builds it up and i think even those like dreams and ideas and you know, that's what's, I think, such a driving and strong force behind music and stuff, even anyways. And you can even, and that's something I discovered even later on in life is when recording music and doing a lot of like self-production and stuff, you know, a lot of this has to do with like the moment in the headspace that you're in, in the vibe that you're feeling. Like anyone could maybe like play some particular part or something, but if you're like really excited to, and you're, or they're like you're writing the song right there, or you're in some kind of crazy environment, or you're in front of someone that you're trying to impress or something like that, like, I don't know, things kind of get stepped up to another level and have like an extra little meeting it's almost like you're like a record lathe or something yes. you're taking the energy from what's going on and it's like influencing what your performance style is that yeah. you know that makes a ton of sense because i've i know a, a few musicians i know some athletes and it works in sports too you know there are people who rise oh, to the occasion right. in a, in the big game yeah, yeah because it's not like you want to like knock over one of your teammates in practice or something right, like that. Exactly. <laughs> would hurt somebody and whatever. It doesn't really count. I don't want to sweat too much or something. Yeah, you know, but then you but, get in that headspace for the game and you don't yeah. care. You, you're going for it. You want to win. Sure. Totally. All right, so around trying to get a little bit of the, the timeline here because I'm not 100% sure. So uh, Skywave, was that before or after you went to the Rhode Island School of Design? That's the band that I'm talking about in high school. And okay. So that started in high school. And then I went to Rhode Island School of Design while that was all going on. That would just always kind of be on hiatus or something pretty much when I was gone. You know, we would maybe do some stuff or, you know, it was sort of like we had given it like a strong sort of push before I went to college and try to do things. But being from Fredericksburg, Virginia, you know, it was really actually hard to kind of like book things and stuff. You know, you, you try to like book a show in DC. They were like, you're from Fredericksburg. No, thank you. Yeah. You know? And it's like, you know, it's like, a, what, like a two, two and a half hour, three hour drive. 
it was only an hour. Okay. Oh, real okay. I'm yeah. right in between DC and Richmond. And okay. See, yeah, I'm in I'm in Winchester, so for me to get to Fredericksburg is like three hours, and then but to get okay. to DC is an hour and a half. So okay, kinda, must be like exactly the whole yeah you got it all way <laughs> yeah. So. so what were you studying at Rhode Island School of Design? Uh, industrial design. Oh, and so cool. I wasn't even sure what my major was. I wanted to go in. I thought for painting. And then I was there, and then in the first year, you don't have a major. And then I fell in love with animation. Oh. But the animation department's so small, it's the only except like a few people. So I just thought, and the painting department wasn't like necessarily the best, but like the industrial design department's supposed to be incredible. I don't even, to be honest, really even know what industrial design was. (laughs) It was like, oh, it's supposed to be like a really good department. <laughs> you know, I, I would rather, you know, try to like challenge myself with something that's supposed to be like really awesome and challenging or something. You that's know? Awesome. What do you major so in? Thought, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I thought it was like, this was cool. It was like building things. Like I did have, you know, I did like constructing things out of wood and stuff and, you know, doing that kind of stuff. So I thought okay. maybe that industrial design was, you know, I wasn't exactly sure. And and I definitely was kind of in some ways an oddball in the department. Oh, yeah. You know, it would be like people would sometimes be like dressing in suits and stuff. And like I would look, wow. I think I'd like a or something at the time <laughs> I just look like some grungy dirty kid or something but uh, but it was because the department was also so serious it was i think definitely like helped improve like my work ethic oh. and taking some of these things like very seriously it was like if you were i think is if you were late to class once or something like that you failed the class whoa and so it was like super oh. hard or like oh. You know, so, you know, you, you know, you show up early, you know, yeah. you got to fucking not serious about this stuff. That's and crazy. And some of the things I remember, we had this one class where all we did the entire semester was take like this block of metal and like file it down like to one ten thousandth of an inch, like a little bit smaller. Oh, my God. <laughs> Whoa. So was, you know, there was like some insane mentality of That's- things. Sort of going intense. on. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. But, you know, but that all, you know, you, you start to realize things like, hey, I could actually potentially build anything, you know, or there's yeah. all these kind of things sort of happen in your head like that, which I think really played into um, the pedals, which helped me out future, in the future, you know. Oh, this definitely sounds like it. All right. So the, the pedals and a place to bury strangers, that all, did that happen after? School and, and what made you go to New York? Right after school, I went. I moved back to Virginia, and my plan was. Um, I mean, I fell in love with warehouse life, so I rented this really cheap warehouse in Virginia, and we built these practice spaces and all these bands practiced in there. And I lived in the warehouse, and we built like a recording studio and stuff. I was just like, oh, this is cool. I'm gonna go back to Virginia. I'm gonna reconnect with the Skywave guys, and we're gonna give it like a real go of it you know was what i thought was kind of you know that was at least part of what was going to happen i also got a job uh designing toys or whatever in this oh wow you know so it was like cool it's kind of cool opportunities in a way of like you know you cut you go to a a decent school people want to you know work with you or something like that yeah so it seemed like oh this is cool this is chill i can focus on music do these other things and then it was just like it just i don't know you know didn't seem it seemed it started to kind of fall apart with the band and then, so a buddy of mine randomly called me up and said, you want to move to New York? And I was like, hell yeah. Wow. So that all kind of started and then started to place the right strangers. But before that, there was like this time that this is, then I, at some point I was like, okay, I'm going to go way more serious with the music. I quit the job with the toy company and we're trying to like, you know, book tours and do all this stuff. And we're working on this album that we were working on. And I was just going to really try to give a good go of it. Right. And it was just like so tough. You know, we would like so screen tons of posters and go to like the cities before we were playing and put them up. And, oh, wow. you know, we'd send out all the killers and like, you know, went those days of like the book your own fucking life books and yeah. stuff. Yeah. We'd send out, you know, cassettes and stuff to all the different places wow. and, you know, call, cold call people and do all this stupid stuff. We'd like, you know, we started like a record label, put out some crazy bands and did some other different things and whatnot. <laughs> but, um, but then, so I was living in this warehouse for free 
And then there was this time I had this girlfriend and we wanted to go explore Europe for a month. Okay. And I didn't have any money. And like my expenses were pretty much nothing. And so I had, I'd been at that time, I'd been experimenting with gear that we've been using to like record stuff or trying to build stuff and trying to make things. And then, so I just had this kind of like harebrained idea as the time got closer and closer for us to leave for this trip. I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make an effects pedal and come out with an effect that I thought was so cool. It was just like a forced feedback loop. Ooh. And so Ooh. I was like, oh, nobody's really kind of made this into a pedal that I had known of. And so I was like, this is intriguing. I feel like experimental artists would really like this. And so death by audio was the coolest name I thought I could come up with. <laughs> Total sound annihilation was the pedal I thought sounded incredible. You know, it just yeah. kind of made, built a website and, you know, sent out some things to sort of like advert about it. And basically my big plan was, you know, whatever it was, like sell 30 of these. Yeah. And that would hopefully be enough. I need to go on this trip and backpack around. And I did, I sold like whatever it was, you know, like 35 of them or something oh, crazy. Sweet. Or 40 something, you know, went on that trip, you know, that all happened. And then I just thought, you know, like, oh, that was probably like this weird little push that I did that was gonna be all that ever was gonna be was, you know, but there it's easy enough to build. So when I came back and if, if anyone wanted to order, you know, I'd build more, but wow. you know, I just, people kept on being kind of interested in them. And then as time was going on and I was, you know, already confident with doing that one, I started like, you know, working on other designs for pedals and then started doing that stuff. And then, so uh, yeah. How did you get into in the, in, to start with? I mean, were you modifying your existing pedals to start with, or did you just yeah. jump into making your own from the start? I mean, I was doing a little bit of all that stuff and that even that interest even kind of started before I even went to school at, at RISD. And I was just a little bit like trying to tinker. I think it even I don't even think I knew how to solder until it took me like a year and a half to teach myself how to solder. But there wasn't really any I didn't know anybody else who was doing this stuff and there weren't any really there was no peer to peer resources for any of this. I yeah. was like, you know, I would like read books about electronics and there was like some special even like libraries in different places you could go in like Providence or something or wherever or Boston or something. And I'd go into the library and look in their like small electronics department and like, you know, read one of the books. And I had no freaking clue what the heck I'm even reading. I just thought maybe I'll retain some of this knowledge and I can use this, you know, because maybe it'll give me the secret to make my amp sound like the craziest amp anyone's ever heard of. So, I don't know. And, uh, wow. you know, but at that time too, I'm like, oh, you know, I tried to like build my own guitar, you know, and that failed, you know, and I tried to do, build all these things. I would try to build some pedal and that would fail. And I try to mod some pedal and it would fail. I try to mod an amp and then the amp's broken. You know, I try to do all these things and it was like, but it was at a time too, where you could, you know, I mean, I guess you can do this now too, but it was like, you know, you, you would, maybe someone would give you an amp or someone would give you these things or, you know, you didn't carry this pedal you thought sucked anyway. So you were like, you know, going to mess around with yeah. it or something. And then, um, you know, I just kind of was going on that and trying to do that stuff for a while. And then eventually you kind of, you know, which took years really to sort of be able to start to do things. But because I was all kind of like self-taught and self-working on these things by myself and just working on this random knowledge of what I would read and kind of barely retain, you know, really kind of developed my own sort of like language and sort of way of working with this stuff. Okay. And even now it's like with a lot of the people who I'm working with, like I just kind of come from this stuff from a totally different direction. And also because it's from the direction of where I'm really a musician you know, who wants desperately to make these sounds or desperately wants to make this thing work for this performance or for this record or something. It's like, it's kind of, uh, I don't know. I, th I think it makes death by audio really work in a kind of cool sort of way. It blows me away. Cause I don't even know how pedals work. And, and to, 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 for me to be able to say, Hey, all right, Oliver, I want a pedal that does this. And you figure that out 
That's, I mean, that just blew me. I want a pedal that makes this weird sound. And, and well, th that's also one of the ways that I really learned is I used to do this thing. And there was a thing on my website and stuff. And I would tell people too, is I'll build anything. <laughs> you just tell me what custom thing you want. Wow. And I would send a quote. So someone would be like, I want, you know, uh, a delay flanger or something. And I'd be like, no problem. 300 bucks and I'll make it for you. And it'll be in a month. It'd be like nine months later. Yeah. <laughs> the guy would be fucking pissed at me. You know what I mean? Because I had I was still I'm a, I'm still working on it, man. I promise. I promise. I promise. I the, yeah, I promise. But uh, you know, so that anxiety and that like late nights and working on these things and way after the three hundred dollars is spent right. and all this, but still, uh, you know, that was also a really good learning curve. Wow. To just be like, I'm I'm gonna figure this out, you know, and then. You know, this is a way to make those kind of things sort of possibly happen. And I don't know. Yeah, that was cool. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. And the band is going on at this point, too. And so you had. Yeah, a so yeah, as I came up to moved up to New York, you know, the band, we were doing things like the band really broke in 2007 when our first album came out. But besides that, when I moved up to New York in 2002, you know, we're, we're doing the band and we're playing music and, you know, we used to play every single show we could possibly get, you know, and we're doing this, you know, we're on, and the, but all, all of that time, like Death by Audio was slowly building real organically, yeah. you know, and not like, you know, these things, you know, we, we would work the heck out of all of them and be constantly working on these things. But, you know, it just it all takes practice and all those kinds of things. It's like learning a language or any of that stuff. You know, how did you guys come up with the name A Place to Bury Strangers? That's the first thing that I noticed about the band before even hearing it. I'm like, well, that's a grim name. <laughs> I kind of like it. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, it was the drummer at the time, Justin Avery, you know, he was the guy who he was reading like Aleister Crowley stories <laughs> and he had taken it from that and thought that it was like, and then it was like, we had a list of band names and the bass player. We're going to play our first show. He just, he had put one of the, you know, top five band names on that flyer, you know, a place to bury strangers. And then that was it. Wow. Oh my God. I, yeah. I've heard that happens a lot but the band's names aren't usually as cool as a place to bury strangers well it's one of those things where it's like you know you especially when you're kind of starting out and you get those in those weird awkward moments and you even still have those things where there's like weird ups and downs when you're like you know crossing a border into canada or something <laughs> you're talking to some like old lady in a supermarket or something <laughs> and asking, you know, oh you play music what's your band name you, you know or like or someone you know where you're kind of like you know <laughs> oh, crap how do i make this not sound like i'm this super emo morbid dude yeah. you know or a total psychopath yeah a total psychopath yeah exactly like what's so, the name of your band elder grandma elder abuse oh, oh yeah oh, yeah oh, exactly. i love elder abuse elder abuse yeah <laughs> Yeah, you'd love them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, My grandson's in elder abuse. Have you heard of them? Yeah, I exactly. Can... How did you become the vocalist? I mean, was that something that you wanted to do or by default? Yes. Yeah, so it was like, it was, ba I mean, there's like some even confusion on like Wikipedia. I don't know who goes in, like changes these things or whatever, but it's basically like, uh, it's all good, whatever. The, um, but basically there was like some guys who were like approached me and were like, Hey man, we're trying to start this band. That sounds like slow dive or something like that. And I was like, fuck yeah. And they were like, we need a drummer, you know? And I was like, I'll play drums with you guys. You know, when we went and jammed is like, then some of those people kind of like left or whatever, you know? And then at some point it was like, you know, it was slowly kind of like writing some songs together. Okay. You know, nobody had any songs or knew anything, right. you know, whatever. <laughs> then it's like, I invite my buddy who was the guy who ended up naming the band and place for strangers to come and play drums with us. You know, and I'm just the kind of guy who, like, I love to write songs. Yeah. And I love to do stuff. So it's like, if nothing's going on, I'm curious, you know, and want to, like, you know, hear what kind of crazy songs we could come up with and do these things. So, you know, I'm just writing. I'm just the guy who's writing any songs for the band yeah. or anything like that, <laughs> you know, really. And then so... 
you know, you you then are like, oh, someone should be saying something. I'm going <laughs> to write some lyrics and doing some stuff, you know, because that's ultimately what you think of as like going to be some cool song or something. So yeah. and I was still writing songs from the Skywave days on my own at that time, too. Like, okay. I don't even know what's going to happen with these songs and, you know, just writing songs for myself and whatnot. And so it was really kind of, you know, I don't know. I was the one you know, making the band a band or anything, right. you know, okay. otherwise it was like, you know, some dudes who wanted to just like hang out together, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had some instruments or something like that. You know what I mean? I remember we used to practice in this guy's music store in New, New York state or whatever. And it was like over the GW bridge and all this stuff. But it was like, it would just be like, we'd go sit there and like talk about like, oh man, look, they got this Vox amp in the store. And I'd be like, oh, cool. <laughs> you know? And it was like, maybe it was the beginning days of like Facebook or something. It was like, check out these cars on Facebook. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> oh, cool, man. Or maybe it was, it was probably MySpace or something, yeah. you know. <laughs> and eventually, hey, we should probably, you know, play. Yeah, we're like, oh, hey, man, check this out. I figured out how this, you know, Jesus and Mary Chain song goes or something. Oh, cool, dude. Yeah, you, yeah. Know? <laughs> you know. <laughs> What happened first? I mean, you mentioned that the first album was what really kind of took off. I think it was Pitchfork really had a, a great I mean, review. That, I mean, that was really it. So we were playing shows and we were trying to do stuff. You know, we played a couple of like really small tours. We played tons of shows in New York all the time. And um, we were playing some show in Boston one time. And this guy, this guy who had the blog brainwashed. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but he like was at the show and he, uh, or he was like, you know, hey, I want, you know, because I used to sell CDRs of like demos and stuff like that. We would sell them at shows. Okay. He was like, hey, I think these demos are really sick. I want to put them on a CD and release it as an, an, an album, you know, and I'll give you guys all the money. Oh, you cool. Know? And I was like, I don't know, man. You know, <laughs> like, I, do we really want to do this CD of demos and stuff? I was like, I don't know if this is really a good idea. The other guys in the band were like, oh, come on, you know, this would be cool. You don't have to burn CDs anymore, you know, and all this stuff. And I was like, I can't I hurt, get right? You know, yeah, but it was like, maybe it was even like a year later or something or six months later. I was like, okay, you can, we can do it, but you got to limit it to just 500 copies because I don't really want anyone to know about this. Wow. I was like, okay, let's do that. Because I was thinking, I tried so hard in Skywave. You know, we tried so hard to push the limits and, you know, we had like, I don't even know how many albums, like five albums or something. And we did, wow. you know, all sorts of stuff and everything. And, and it never went anywhere really, or at least kind of satisfaction. So I was like, I'm going to wait until we have a proper label. You know, when I moved to New York with the place of Rare strangers, we're going to go to a real studio. We're going to record. Like I want this band to like, it's either going to be a band. We're just going to have fun and play live shows or if someone really does want to take it seriously, we'll take it seriously or something. Okay. But so I was, I didn't want to even do this. And then, and then, you know, so we made the CDs and it was like pitchfork gave it like best new music or something. Wow. And then it was, just like complete change of you know your kind of life overnight really where it was like all of a sudden there was people who were interested in booking our band you know wow. in place be like oh yeah cool you know and then there would be you know people just kind of you know sort of made those things to where then there was like actual labels who were actually interested and all this stuff and, and, and you know we were a type of band who's a working man's band so it was like you know you get a band who wants to work really hard and you give them the opportunity to like play shows and do stuff. And we were like, hell yeah, you know, this is so sick. And so it was awesome. You know, that was definitely like, I don't know. It, it's, it's amazing how it just one publication, one article and one publication could change everything. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it would have to be, it's even hard to make all that stuff kind of even happen in some ways now. I mean, yeah. now I think that there's other ways where, 
you know, there are people who are kind of making their own. And a lot of these like record labels and stuff don't do as much as they used to. Oh, for I sure. mean, even pitchfork and stuff doesn't even necessarily do as much. And, and it doesn't even, you know, you also have to be the type of people who are willing to then go and drop your lives and put in the work. I mean, and that's what we were kind of doing sort of even anyways, you know, so it's like, um, you know, all of those things kind of have to happen. So it, it's kind of difficult. Was the band success did, did the band f uh, have success before the uh death by audio effects or was it the other way around or was it about the same time it was all you know kind of just that that one big jump in pitchfork really helped the band out you know but the pedal company had been slowly building all throughout this time too okay. and we then in, in uh 2005 got that warehouse which was the death by audio warehouse which is like the venue in new york and so that, even though there wasn't like a lot of shows really kind of going on at that time, you know, that was kind of sort of starting up. We're living with a lot of people, you know, all these things are kind of happening. You know, we're getting sort of get, starting to get a name for ourselves in New York. Things were happening. The band probably would have been slowly growing over the years, right. but that was definitely a big giant boost. But all of those things, you know, even though it wasn't really intentional, is such a kind of you know, all, all of those avenues sort of feed off of each other Okay. and sort of make everything that happens, you know, with the band and the pedal company and the venue and the record labels and all the random different things that I've been involved <laughs> with kind of help feed off of each other and sort of to help each other out in a sort of way. And so I guess it's sort of lucky to have your interests relate to each other so, <laughs> in some sort of way. Yeah, but yeah. yeah for sure. <laughs> And you've got, for Death by Audio, I mean, and from now on, we're going to just be bouncing back and forth between the band and, and the companies. Cool. You've got some incredible people using your effects pedals, like The Edge, Nine Inch Nails, Wil even Wilco. You know, I, when I think of Wilco, I don't think of Nine Inch Nails. So how, totally. how did these guys find out about Death by Audio? Was it, was it through the band or was it through some... Some of those things are in all different ways, but okay. one thing that's like is I think really kind of, and even, you know, like we did a tour with nine inch nails and stuff. Yeah. So I mean, they found out about it. I think that might've even been, I don't even know if they, he knew that the two things were related or something, oh. but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but this stuff, because like musicians are a kind of a breed like the record hound or something or whatever, Hunter or whatever it is, where like, they're always searching for new crazy stuff to make these crazy sounds. Yeah. Especially you think about people like Jeff Tweedy or something, or somebody who loves to experiment, you know, there you go, then, you know, it kind of just sort of makes sense. Okay. And so all these people too, who, where they're searching for, you know, they want to try it all or something, because it's just kind of the nature of like, you know, always wanting a new sound or always looking for something that can yeah. be, you know, something really cool piece that they could be inspiration for their art or something. Yeah. And somebody like the edge, will you make a pedal for him? Is, does that eventually find its way into a production pedal or is that something that's bespoke just for him and, and you just leave that for him? All of those things are different. Some of those things would be just specific to people like the edge. That's a specific kind of like thing where, you know, they bought all the pedals that we make and that's all. I never made a, a pedal particularly for the edge. Oh, wow. I mean, that was a crazy thing. It was like, there was, um, it was like his guitar tech or something had like sent an email, which is like, do you guys have all your pedals in stock or something at the moment? You know, we wrote back and we were like, yeah, we have all the pedals, you know, we had, you know, like eight or so pedals at the time, right? We're like, yeah, we have all the pedals. And then it was maybe like an hour later, the doorbell rings and it's a courier of someone. Cause the New York has like a courier service yeah, thing yeah. with check for whatever it was like 800 bucks or, or two dollars <laughs> whatever it was for all the pedals and he's gonna take them to wherever you two is recording oh my you can do that stuff yeah which is insane that is that is insane holy <laughs> god but you know that's like all that yeah i mean and, and even i don't know it's just kind of you know those people who are like the artists and into that stuff they're trying to find out and share this information with their buddies and stuff i've heard multiple people say that like lou reed told them about the pedals and that's why they liked them or something it's what? like what in the world you know like all those things are just like so kind of insane but you know there's it kind of makes some bits of sense because there's only like so many pedals or something that are out there Okay. And so if 
and especially if you're making really crazy ones that sound unlike anything else, these artists, they want to try out what to have their own unique sound. And yeah. so there you go. It's all, all they can do. All right. So for someone like me, who's not exactly knowledgeable about this kind of thing, I have played guitar poorly for decades now, and I've got a bunch of different pedals, but I've never been to really no, what what is the difference between the distortion fuzz and overdrive? No difference. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I always, it's just, some, I always it's just some fool who wants to say some really specific, <laughs> you know, full crap about it or something. You I know, always it's had like, that I fit feeling. Yeah, I mean the same thing too is like you don't need any fancy gear. You know, you don't need all this junk. You know, I've got microphones, which cost a lot of money yeah. and I've got really crappy microphones. No difference. <laughs> you know, I've got, I've got like audio in inter- I got the, this Behringer audio interface that costs like $99. Yeah. You know, and then I've got some other interface that probably costs $5,000 <laughs> and they, they're, they're, they're the, the same. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh. All this, it, it's all like, that's all kind of like, um, you know, sure. The one is maybe has, is a little bit easier or there's a little bit of some kinds of things, but the, what's really special about a song is like, you know, a cool performance or something creative or something neat that's going on. These other things, you know, they can help augment and make these things happen, but it can even just have to be about what your feeling is with that. You know, maybe that fuzz pedal is just special to you. Mm-hmm. You know, it does react in the right way that kind of does that. Or it kind of even pushes you in a way. Or you, you hear that, like, your favorite guitarist uses that fuzz pedal. So when you, you know, you play it, you're kind of like, I don't know, it kind of just has that magic for you or something. You know, that's yeah. a lot of it. You know, we try to push that barrier and try to make things where, like, it would, like, make someone want to experiment in a certain direction or something, or okay. it can generate some sounds that are different than you would think, or it's the sound of like a broken fuzz. So you really got to work for it, you know, to like really make it, you know, make yeah. it kind of sound sort of crazy. Or it takes, if you're a virtuoso guitar player, it takes it and destroys that. So it's like good luck, yeah. you know, and that, but that can be like a really interesting thing or something, you know? So it's kind of like, and I, that's even my approach to playing music and all sorts of stuff is, you know, what's like other additional things that you can do or what's ways that you can like really throw a wrench in the system and kind of like sort of, you know, I don't know, just do something powerfully different or something, if possible, you know. Yeah. Give yourself some kind of limitation or barrier and work around it. And I may not be explaining that the best way, but what if the one constant in this show is that having a boundary or some type of like even if it's just a deadline forces you to be more creative it's it's that's so true i mean really like deadlines and things are fantastic yeah you know kind of stuff and you'll even know just because it's like if you do have a deadline notice when you do most of the work it's right before the deadline yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's like oh shit here comes the deadline yes. you know you start to second guess your work and you want to like improve it and you want to be as good as possible for the deadline so i mean that's a great way to work and do those things i mean i remember in those skywave days the last album we recorded you know, it was when I was getting started to get into computer recording and I must have, we spent two years working on the record and it was like, you know, constantly recording and mixing and, you know, I'd have like, you know, mix number 273 or something like that of this stuff. Wow. And then, you know, later you listen to like, Mix number three and mix number 273, no difference. Yeah. <laughs> really handy. You know, it was just like, you know, I don't know. You know, it was like it was more about the essence of the song or more about like those kind of things that like really made a difference and stuff, I think. One of the questions that I really wanted to ask you is, is the sound of the band, there's definite influences like My Bloody Valentine, a lot of shoegaze influence, sure. but I, I hear things like um, Ego Death from Exploding Head. To me, that sounds more like a swan song than a My Bloody Valentine song.
So what would be an influence that maybe I wouldn't expect in your songwriting? I don't know, man. I, you don't know. I, I, um, I don't know. All sorts of bands, I'm sure. Okay. You know, I guess kind of like, I think one of those things that, you know, I've been, we've been sort of doing this stuff for a while and it's so kind of like weirdly, we're in like a little bubble or something. I feel like I've almost like never connected with a lot of other people doing stuff in some kinds of ways and oh, sort really? of. You know, sort of, I don't know, kind of like, you know, maybe I'm still, I, you know, even the, the, the way that we record stuff and all this stuff, it's probably not the way other people would. And, you know, the way <laughs> assembling stuff or writing songs, I feel like, you know, we've just been kind of trapped on another little weird island or something, writing and playing music yeah. you know, separate from the rest of the world or something. So I don't know, which, you know, makes our albums probably sound, you know, insane compared to other people's stuff in some ways or maybe that's why maybe that's why we don't get like you know we're not on a pizza hut commercial or something you know but that's fine (laughs) but i kind of like embraced that and that kind of even really happened at that point in which pitchfork you know when that first album hit and people liked it is because i was for a while my whole idea was like let me figure out how people actually properly do things and then once people liked it and it was the stupid ideas that i had that they liked i was like you know what forget that i'm just gonna embrace all the dumb ideas (laughs) we're just gonna go have fun and do all the you know and kind of go with on what sort of like the kind of high school ethos of what i thought a band was supposed to be yeah back in the day and we've kind of just stuck with that oh, sort of since, you know so it's sort of like this you know people will be like oh you know why didn't they record a funk album or something or do this thing and we're <laughs> yeah. always like no we're gonna be like a punk band that plays electric guitars and you know and, and does this kind of crazy music well i've noticed you don't do a lot of ballads <laughs> no, totally. so, you know, Florida's a ballot. Just never made it on an album. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so there, it's not out of the realm of possibilities that there, there could be a, a place to bury strangers, oh, yeah, totally. like a, a meatloaf covers album. Oh, definitely. That's definitely coming on the horizon now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, now I'm definitely <laughs> looking forward to that. So, <laughs> with writing, do you? Is there any a process that you go through? I mean, do you make yourself write every day? And do you use riffs more or do you use sounds more as inspiration? Because your songs are filled with both. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess I have some sort of classic kinds of sensibilities of riffs and stuff in some ways. And, you know, I, I guess as sort of each iteration of the band or whatever or you know, I try to kind of change things up to keep it sort of exciting Mm -hmm. in some ways. So there was maybe a time when I was like trying to write some perfect song and there was other times when we were a band and it was like just sort of more about sounds or you'd be kind of getting involved in that. And, you know, some, you know, I guess I'm sort of open to any type of inspiration. And sometimes that was with like, you have an idea you know, and it's really uh, like a, a res- it could be a response to something like on the last album we did on See Through You. It was like I was just having a really miserable time with the kind of like sort of like a, a breakup with the past band members. Yeah. And that the whole band was sort of dissolving. We had been working on this record where we, we do this thing where we sometimes perform out in the crowd. Well, I'd done all these recordings of all these of, of, of these crowd jams that we had done, okay. you know, so we were then the idea for that album was going to be we would take all these crowd jams and turn them into songs. And so we'd kind of worked on it for a while and stuff. And then the band, you know, it was just it just took a real bad turn and it was just not getting along. And it was just miserable. And I felt like betrayed and stuff by my like closest friends. And all oh. this time. I was like just going mentally insane and that was like right before the pandemic hit and the pandemic hits you know that was like a, a week before the pandemic hit or who oh, knows geez. you know and then so that was like 
you know, that album was really like recorded out of, you know, my like sorrow and working through my mental insanity of this while being trapped in my house for the most part or trapped in the studio, like weirdly, like in the wee hours of the night and all when all this, you know, me and my, my fiance, we got a coronavirus and it was like, um, you know, real early on. And so that just like screwed up my whole schedule where I was like waking up at like 10 PM or something oh, like, geez. and like, you know, going to bed at 1 PM and like oh. crazy stuff like that. So it was like, just sort of like such a surreal kind of time. And, you know, things weren't necessarily, we were taking shifts at work and stuff. So we'd be always be like lots of like alone time and, yeah. you know, weird kind of insanity. And so I don't know, oh. but whatever i kind of went off on a tangent that's but, right uh, but, like you know some of those times you know we've done other things when recording albums one of the albums we did a thing where uh, uh me and the bass player we would write and record and finish a song one song a day and oh, we did cool. that for like two months you know and then kind of pick sort of the best ones there's been other times i wrote this riff the other day where i thought of the riff in a dream and wow. so I was like, I was like, man, I've got to, I've got to remember this immediately because <laughs> it was like, when you write a riff in a dream, you that know what I mean? So, awesome. Yeah. And then I don't know, sometimes you would just even hear a thing when we had the show space, I wrote a lot of songs as well too, because we would be, we lived in the back and the show space was in the front. Okay. And you'd hear this sound and you'd be like, holy shit, what the fuck? This band is fucking heavy as yeah. hell. Who is this? This is crazy. It sounds like, you know, someone's beating on these pipes and stuff like that. You'd run in there and it's like some guy on an acoustic guitar or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but it was so interesting how like your mind would like play tricks on you. So that would be, I would be like, oh shit. Okay. I don't really want to see this guy with the acoustic guitar. But I have this really good idea for a song right now. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd go like run back and kind of like lay down what you thought like this song was or something that you were listening to <laughs> in the other room. Awesome. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, I think some of those kinds of ideas and those sort of tricks or, you know, trying to write songs like with a bunch of people together all on the spot. You know, we used to do this thing, too, where we would like you you, um, and I'll even still do this with friends to this day. But uh, we used to pretend that it would be like you pretend like you're on a radio show. OK. And, and so you're like, you know, this next song is a metal deep metal track called, you know, yeah. Back to the Fire. You know, one, two, three, four. And then you have to play that song real quick. Oh, that's you know, great. Whatever it is, even though nobody knows what that song is. And then you laugh or whatever. And then like, you know, a minute or two later. <laughs> you could be like this next song is the you know whatever you just make up some other whole different thing or something and then you know it kind of keeps like the ideas flowing and then sometimes you kind of get some kind of cool stuff to maybe uh work off of oh, and no now way. we do it more seriously where you're like sit around with some drum machines or set stuff up but you're like planning to kind of record okay so it's sort of like the idea is write songs right on the spot and see what happens okay so you you're know? You're set up to record, to write, but you, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. And it's kind of like fun because also when you're like there in your space and you're curating it with some friends, like you kind of want to like excite them and sort of also, you know, you're like, well, let's try out this drum machine or something. Or, hey, man, I got this crazy keyboard in the back. Why don't you try this thing out? <laughs> and you got somebody <laughs> plugging some stuff and it's like, you know, it can be just like, you know, you, you can record hours of trash. Yeah. But maybe sometimes you really get like some awesome magic of like, oh, this is such a cool song or something. And this is like, and that's like those kind of moments where, I don't know, I, I live for that stuff. I yeah. want to hear like some cool pop song or some cool, you know, crim, insane industrial track or whatever. You know, it's like, you know, I'm still a lover of music and always trying to search out things. Yeah. So I want to hear some cool bands that I think are really interesting and doing something unique. And then also being someone who can make some music. I want to create some music. That's like really awesome. The album that came out last year, see through you that in looking at it, I've been listening to it, but I'd never, I hadn't really looked at it. it. It looks like it's just you. Is that the case? I mean, did you do everything right? Record all the instruments? Everything's just you? 
There's a, a buddy, uh, this guy Paul Jacobs, a Canadian. He, I, I mastered his album, and for trade, he recorded drums on two songs. Okay. And there's drums that he played on one of those songs. The other one didn't make it on the album. But, uh, <laughs> so, but besides that, like that was something that I had been was doing at the time, and then really during the pandemic too, and and all this stuff as I was. I was like, you know what? I, I really should be able to play the drums myself well. And so I was playing the drums every single day wow. and really trying to do that. And so that was even, it really made it where I was like, oh, I really got to play the drums because I recorded the drums on that record too. So I was like, I'm really going to try to do this, you know, and really play the drums on this record and make that stuff happen. And, you know, some of those tracks, you know, there might be like some cheating where it's like, you know, there's all the drums being played and the kick drum is played separately or yes. something like that. You know, <laughs> That's you know, okay. or something. Or there's like some floor time overdubs and stuff like yeah. that. You know, I tried my darndest to <laughs> you know, kind of do that stuff. So, um, yeah. I mean, you know, that was I mean, that's the way a lot of like even back in those kind of Skywave days was a little bit of how we would do a lot of that stuff where it would be like, you know, and even that first record, it's like someone has an idea for the song. You want to share it with the other band members. Yeah. And so you want to like, you know, make it sound awesome right from the get go. So you're like, oh, I'm going to record a drum machine to this reverb pedal and yeah. do whatever, do something because you want everyone in the band to be like, oh, hell yeah, let's play that song, you know, or yeah. something. Yeah, I so, don't know. So what does the band look like n now at this point? Is it, is it, has it been rebuilt with more people or is, is it just kind of just you at this point? No, totally. So after that kind of bad sort of breakup with the band members, you know, I was like, you know what? I want to really just have this band with like my really close friends. And so what I did is, uh, is every time I'd go back down to Fredericksburg, I would always have such a good time with uh, John and Sandra. And John is the old drummer from Skywave. Sandra is his wife. And we would always just like laugh our asses off nonstop, you know? So I was like, if they're down and they want to do it, you know, and they had a, they have a band where the two of them play together. Oh, cool. Um, called Tony East Coast. And so, you know, I asked them if they would maybe be interested and they were like, hell yeah. So they would start like driving up kind of during the pandemic and we started playing and, you know, it's like things just kind of kept on going on and on and we just had a really good time and it just seemed like it was a natural, the right kind of thing to do. So oh, cool. that's right now. So it's been, yeah, it's been great. So that's the live Plus Break Strangers at this that's point? A lot, that's a lot. And then and now, and we've been writing a bunch of songs together. So awesome. whenever, you know, as things are going on, it'll be a record with like all of us on it whenever that next one is done and stuff. So. Okay. And so Death by Audio also has a, a record label. And is that still active? Is that still, you still putting stuff out through that? Well, so the Death by Audio record label is not. I mean, but it's uh, but there's another record label that was started <laughs> during the pandemic as well called Dead Strange, okay. which is like a combination okay. of sort of Death by Audio and A Place to Very Stranger. It's like those two words kind of slam together. Makes so sense. That was, yeah, exactly. So that, it was like um, the manager for A Place to Very Strangers, who's been the manager since that first album, he and him, he's just like a buddy of mine, really. I mean, he's, he's a great manager, great dude. He like books a lot of venues in New York and does all sorts of things. But anyways, he was always talking about like starting a label if we, because um, we finally, our contract was up with Dead Oceans, the record label that we we're on. So we could have tried to pursue to re-sign with them. Um, so there was that option where we could maybe do things ourselves. Okay. And then there was my buddy Mitchell, who is a New Zealander who lives in Berlin, who was really interested in starting a label. So we just kind of got everybody together and was like, you know what, let's give it a shot and try to do this. And then it was like, it also seemed like it kind of made sense that we could maybe even help a bunch of bands out. 
And okay. real quickly, we got like real official distribution through like Red Eye. I don't know if you know anything about distributors or anything, but they're like the um. I mean, it's an insane amount of work running the record label, and it's it's tough to you want to sign every act that happens, yeah. you know, that is awesome and that you love, but it's like you really got to be like, man, I don't know if we can handle this. But anyways, it's another story. Yeah, yeah. The, um, <laughs> but so. Uh, so we get this distribution with Red Eye, and what's so great about them is they focus really on like they, their whole kind of idea is that no store is too small. So it's like you're really getting these records from all these different independent bands and stuff, and every like mom and pop record store, as well as like bigger ones and stuff. So it just seems like oh, this is a really cool thing that we could be doing is tie the whole a place to bury a stranger's name on to these bands that we think are fucking awesome, and get them in like actually in record stores and people to kind of like see this sort of stuff. So oh, cool. it was like. Yeah, it just seemed like the right kind of thing to do. And then also, it was more of like, because we'd be doing this stuff on a small, or on a whatever, on a different, you know, more of a smaller store scale, it seemed like a cool thing for a place to bury strangers too, okay. to kind of get like, to be like really, you know, where you're in with like music lovers and stuff. And we're not really like trying to knock down the doors and break into like Walmart or something, right. but you know, <laughs> if we get like people that you like want to be at shows and are actually like really excited about it and stuff. And I know, love that. Yeah. It sounds to, to me like, most of your career is based on on your altruism, and I, I love it. It's just that's it, such an awesome attitude to have about the whole thing. I mean, I'm lucky to have done that stuff. And I mean, I always tell people too, it's like, you know, there's probably something that you love to do, you know, and that's what you should be focusing on. And sometimes, you know, you got to work a job and you got to do this kind of stuff, you know, but be trying to push it and do the stuff that you love to do, even just for a little bit every time as, as much as you can. And then hopefully slowly over time that can take over you know, your work in those kinds of things, doing what you want. Yeah. And, you know, worst case scenario, if you're doing what you love to do and it doesn't work out for you, you're doing what you love to do. It's exactly. not so bad. Right? It's okay. You know, exactly. It's not so bad. You're doing what you want to do. Yeah. You know, that's okay. You know, so. Whether or not you get paid for it, who cares? Yeah. I mean, exactly. it'd be great to get Whatever. paid. Who to, cares, man? Yeah, it'd be great to get paid to do it. But if, if you can at least do it, like you said, you're yeah, still doing that it. Is, that is so cool, you know. And so, I don't know. So, what is uh, what's upcoming for a place to bury strangers? Are you guys touring, recording? <laughs> Yeah, we got a bunch of tours coming up. There's like, um, you know, we're leaving at the, at the end of January and going to Europe for like a couple of weeks. And it's like all sort of like Eastern Europe and oh, wow. North Europe and stuff. And um, yeah, that's going to be cool. There's another European tour later in the year and festivals and all sorts of stuff. We're here. We're recording. Oh, awesome. at the shop. Um, you know, we're always coming out with more pedals and stuff. And you know, there's always nonstop, you know, of all these kinds of things. What is the best way for people to follow what Death by Audio is doing, what A Place to Bury Strangers are doing, and, and anything else you're working on? I don't know. Social media, websites, yeah, anything like that? Or probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's probably those things. Yeah. I don't know. Focus on yourself. Don't go on social media. You oh, know? Yeah, I agree. Do the stuff you love. I mean, I'm sure. Yeah, we have we have those websites like a place to strangers dot com or deathfario dot com, and you know we're on all the Instagrams and the Facebooks and all that stuff. And so, if somebody whatever. wants to come to a show. Uh, is, is it easier yeah, totally. to find out on the website or through social media or, or both? Yeah, or I mean, you know, there's some of those sites too, like bands in town and stuff or yeah. like song kick or something. If you guys, anybody uses those, those are great things to just find out about shows. There's even some of those places. Like if you live, I can't remember where exactly. Maybe it's like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles or something like things like, Oh, my rockness or something. Okay. It's really great. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, through the websites, we're, you know, we'll be pushing those things on like social media. I'm sure if we can, that's always a great way to kind of figure it out. And, and if management's you get, for, no, 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 <laughs> no, to do that. So management, you know, they, they got other more important things to do, I'm sure. But, uh, but so, um, but yeah, you know, like if you get the chance to go see live music, if you're not the person who's gone to see much live music, like, 
you know, definitely go out and go to like, you know, bands in town or these or like song kick or find some bands that you like and try to go to their shows. Like that's such a magical experience. And it's I feel like people are doing that stuff less and less and, you know, just watching like live recordings on YouTube or something where uh, you just don't get the real thing. No, you, you can't feel that. Totally. And it's awesome too. like even going to more like independent shows and stuff, you know, even see a band like a place to bury strangers. I mean, you know, I've seen a, a ton of shows. I've played a ton of shows. Like we're doing something that is really weird to see, yeah. you know, so, <laughs> so, you know, it's an experience based on like what I think is the most intense experience in the world or something. Well, I, so, you know, I've heard it, tell you know, it, good luck, but, <laughs> I've heard tell that you guys are the loudest band in whatever city you're playing. Sure. Yeah, they say that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Somebody says that. You know, we like loud. Oh, but what I was saying about like independent music oh, yeah. is it's even different than going to like some show, like some giant concert, which is huge. It's a huge thing because if you're there at a show like that we're playing or some other kinds of smaller bands and stuff are playing, like you can walk right up to the front of the stage. Yeah. You know, you can even like meet the people who are in the band. You can see like people are, you know, you feel like kind of more of an interesting in connection to actually something that's happening right there and something yeah. that's really going on. You can be there right with like the struggle of the musicians trying to make this stuff. I mean, I think that's something kind of uh, that not even everybody gets to experience, but they kind of should. I think you're right. Cause there's a huge difference between going to see, you know, let's just say a Metallica at some enormous sure. stadium and a place to very strangers at like the black cat or someplace totally. small where you're right up there. There's to say that the Metallica show isn't wicked. No, I mean, that's no. All do. but it's almost a little bit even more at the Metallica show. Like you're watching a movie or yeah, something, exactly. you know, but if you're at the, you know, whatever, some of those other shows and you're kind of like, I don't know, you're seeing like human struggle, you know, or something like that, yeah. like right of you, <laughs> you know, you're, you know, you're kind of like, you know, seeing someone up against all odds and, you know, really kind of trying to pull it off. You know, they don't yes. necessarily have a whole team of people behind them, you know, making all this stuff happen. And, exactly. and it's kind of cool. They're bringing in their own, they're, they're loading and unloading their own equipment, you know, so that's. Yeah, I mean, I drove to this show. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, that guy, he took off work to play this show. Yeah. You know what I mean? All that kind of weird. <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of all that, like the, the, the people meet it. Oh, yeah. And I've discovered some of my favorite bands at shows that either I wasn't expecting to go to or they were maybe the opener. And I mean, that's another thing, too. It's like a lot of times these bands, you know, it's like, well, as much as we possibly can, we like help and curate the opening bands. You know, they're so awesome. Often bands that I think are freaking phenomenal and wicked bands that everyone should go see so you know you kind of get this opportunity to even discover new music or people who are interesting artists or other kinds of things which i think is like uh i don't know it's just a pretty cool thing it is it's it's amazing it's it's an experience and it's uh not to be missed and it, it, it helps smaller artists keep going and create more music Totally. And, you know, it's it's like one of those kind of weird things. I always say, like, you know, if you want a band to play an encore, you know, just don't stop yelling for the band. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you can get everyone all fired up around you and everyone can be clapping and excited. And that's even the same thing about like these, you know, if you like particular styles of music or whatever it is, like if you're there supporting those bands and you're seeing these bands, you're kind of curating what music is going to become popular and stuff in a way, you know, it takes real humans, you know, support to kind of sort of do that stuff. So it's yeah. like if you're out seeing bands and then you find out about some small band that nobody's ever heard of that you like and you keep on going to see their shows, then more people and you tell, bring your friends, yeah. then more people are going to find out about this. And then there's a a real shot that like this music will continue on and you know really change some other people's lives and stuff it's like there's a real community around these kinds of things and you know i don't even know if people even like realize some of that stuff sometimes because sometimes all they do is go to the britney spears concert or something and yeah you know i'm sure and like, you know, whatever, all, all of those people kind of had to start sort of somewhere and stuff. So Yeah, but Disney. You know, whatever. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> well, man, I've, I've you... kept you for a while, man. <laughs> I really do appreciate all the time. Yeah, for sure, man. Thanks, man. It was a, a, a real pleasure to speak with you. Well, thank you. Okay. <laughs>
Let's see each other. Let's see each other. 